So right in the middle of the bulletin, I have for you Mark 6, 1 to 6. Uh, we are leaving our series in 1 Samuel until next fall, and we're resuming our series in Mark that we began one year ago. And we'll do this through the summer. And so here's Mark 6, 1 to 6. Please listen as I read the very word of God. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joses, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. He could do no mighty work there except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So this week has been a week like no other in our nation's history. I'm not saying it's the worst week. I can imagine when the Civil War broke out. That was worse. The day of infamy as, war, as Japan bombed Pearl Harbor was worse. I lived through 9-11, that was worse. But yet still, this week was like a week like no other. And as I ponder and think about how divided our country is, and as I think about the fallout from the events of the siege of the Capitol, uh, which claimed four lives, right on the hinge of uh, it being solidified that Congress, both the House and the Senate, and the presidency are all now under control of those who are hostile and offended by Christianity, I'm concerned for our country. I'm concerned for how we move forward. I'm concerned for our children. Life in this country, humanly speaking, I say humanly speaking because we know who's in control, but humanly speaking, life in this country for Christians is more uncertain than it ever will be, or than it ever has, I should say. And I think it's time for Christians to get serious about being Christians. And when I say that, I don't mean, I'm not talking about political action, but instead, what this book tells me the Christian life is. This book is not about personal comfort. It's not about affluence. It's not about maintaining a way of life or political power. It's not about physical power at all. This book is about the gospel of Jesus Christ, which it calls in Romans 1. 16, the power of God for salvation to all who believe. So this is about. Doesn't take place by force, but by love. There's a popular show out on Disney Plus, whether you have it or not, I don't know, called The Mandalorian. Mandalorian comes from a tribe, and, and, and everything that he does, he says, this is the way. He lives by a code, a set of principles it's interesting terminology because the way is the first designation the Bible gives in the New Testament to believers of Jesus Christ. It's used before the word Christian is ever used. They were simply known as those who follow the way. What is the way? It is a code we live by. We walk by faith, not by sight. It's a code of an upside-down kingdom where when we see our weakness, then we are truly strong. When we see our need, we get grace by faith. We shine light into a dark world. We conquer enemies not by force, but by love. 
We don't put faith in the systems of this world. We remember that we are strangers in a strange land, foreigners passing through here, and we have a citizenship in a different kingdom, and from it, that kingdom, we await our Savior. This is the way. I'm reminded in today's text that there is nothing new in our country, going on in our country that hasn't happened in history. That confusion over truth is not new. That people being offended by different ideas and worldviews is not new. That the message of Christianity and Jesus Christ himself being rejected and people being offended by that is not new. Jesus famously said, they persecuted and rejected me. They will do the same to you. That is, of course, if you are living by the way instead of by the way of the world. Today we see Jesus' own family and friends, the people he grew up with, the people he played with, his aunts and uncles, people he worked with, rejecting him. It says they are offended at him. It should be no surprise to us then that this country that grew up with Jesus in our homes, that grew up with Judeo-Christian principles at our roots, grew up with Jesus, is now offended by him. We'll see in today's text that familiarity breeds contempt. It makes faith even harder despite what people see and hear. People can't even know truth anymore in this country. But there is hope for those that recognize their need through faith. And when I think of life being uncertain... And the events of this week and whatever, whatever impulses that created in you, the fight or flight response, today's text reminds us that there's actually a third option. Fight, flight, or faith. I put the points in your bulletin. I also have many notes there at the bottom that I may or may not cover, but you can always use them for for further study about this text. One nice thing about the Gospels is the stories tend to be shorter. You know, in those First Samuel texts, sometimes the stories went on for chapters, and so you have to read a lot of Scripture, and it's hard to unpack it in the time you have. Here are six verses. Let's look at the, the first point I have there, unparalleled, I'm sorry, unbelieving astonishment and offense. We need to recap where we are in the ministry of Jesus. Again, it's been since May since we've been studying uh, the Gospel of Mark. Jesus comes on the scene in the Gospel of Mark not like he did in the other Gospels. In Matthew and Luke, they talk about his birth. There's genealogies. Here, it's like he comes out of nowhere. It says his hometown is Nazareth. So the, the story, and we're coming fresh off of Christmas, he's born in Bethlehem. He flees to Egypt. And then when he comes back to Israel, he lives in Nazareth. That's his hometown. Lives there for about 30 years. He's a carpenter. But when his ministry is inaugurated, he comes to John the, Bapti John the Baptist to be baptized. At the baptism, a voice from heaven. You are my beloved son. In you, I am well pleased. From his baptism, he goes into the wilderness, and Mark's gospel gives us a very interesting detail that the others don't. That in the wilderness, he's there with the animals, the wild animals, it says, but he's with the animals. What is he doing in the wilderness with the animals? He's dwelling with God. He's communing with God. He's fasting and praying. A deep sense of unity with the Father, it's meant to hearken us back to the, the first Adam in the garden with the animals dwelling with God in relationship. And if you remember back to Genesis in chapter 3, what happens? A serpent enters. And then in Mark's gospel, what happens? But Satan comes into Christ's presence. He tries to deceive and tempt Christ that there's a way for Satan to relinquish his power over this present darkness of this present age, if Christ will just bow down to him, Satan will relinquish his power and Christ doesn't have to go to the cross. 
and he twists the word of God. But unlike the first Adam, this new Adam, that's what Paul calls him in Romans and 1 Corinthians, Jesus Christ, the new Adam, stands firmly on the promises in the word of God and rejects the, day, the devil. He succeeds where the first Adam, God's son, failed. And he begins his ministry. What is his ministry? Mark chapter 1 in verse 14 to 15 says, Now after John was arrested, Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That's the message. That's his mission to go and say those words and to show people what he means. And so he, commit, he, he, he makes miracles, mighty, mighty miracles, so much that everywhere he goes, the crowds are, are crowding him. He has no time to himself. He would wake up way early in the morning and go off to pray in the wilderness. The disciples would search for him, say, where are you? Everybody's looking for you. Come, let's go back to the people. They're, they're giving you praise. They're, they they want to be with you. He says, no, I must go to the next town and preach the gospel for this is why I came. Not to meet every human earthly need. People went unhealed. He must go and proclaim the year of the Lord's good news. So he leaves. Goes to the next place. People follow him. The miracles start to get in the way of the message. How can that happen? Because people want the miracle more than they want the miracle worker. They want the healing more than the healer. They want the benefits of the kingdom without the king. So then Jesus decides to turn up the heat a little. He decides now, I'm going to forgive sins. And he forgives the sin of a man who was lowered down through the roof of a house man who had no use of his legs or any part of his body under his neck probably. A cripple we would call him. But rather than heal the man initially, what does he do? He forgives the man his sins. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, couldn't believe it. They were livid. You can't forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. This growing conflict would continue over their religious practices and all kinds of things as Jesus reshaped their world and conflicted with their worldview and the Pharisees sought and the religious leaders sought to kill him. Jesus' family from Nazareth comes 20 miles now, his mother and his brothers, because they have to go, they have to go find out what, what Jesus is saying. They think he's crazy. Tell them to stop making waves. Jesus says another astounding comment. Who are my mother and my brothers? Not meant to be rude to his mother who he showed utmost respect for, but to make the point that he is making a new family. He said, these are my mother and my brothers, those who are hearing my words and living them. The disciples were love in life. They're popular. Everywhere they go, they're celebrities. They never knew what to make of Jesus at this point. They get in a boat because after Jesus feeds 5,000, which is really many more, is 5,000 men, they, they wanted to make him king. Jesus sends the, the disciples on a boat. I'm sorry. <laughs> that didn't happen yet. <laughs> but it was another time. Jesus says, I'm going, uh, I need to get away. He had to get away from the crowds. They go on a boat. He falls asleep. A storm rages on. They're straining at the oars, these, these boaters, these fishermen. They finally lash out at Jesus after what seems to be many hours. Don't you care that we're going to perish? The Lord wakes up and calms the storm. Hush, just like that. Be still, it said, he said. And now the disciples said, they, they said, who is this man who even the wind and the waves obey him? They couldn't understand who could control the natural world. They don't know what to make of him. 
When he reaches the other side in Mark chapter 5, a, a man possessed by a legion of demons comes rushing out, falls at his feet, and the demons beg Jesus not to destroy them. So Jesus casts the demons out of the man, calming the storm raging on within the man. And then another effect of that. The Gentiles in that region want nothing to do with Jesus. They beg him to leave them. As I walk you through that, to the point of our text today, what's the common theme? That when Jesus comes into people's lives, when you have an encounter with Jesus Christ, when you experience him, it always demands and commands a response. The people want Jesus, the needy, they love him because he can fix their needs. The religious leaders hate Jesus because he's questioning their authority. The crowds marvel at Jesus' work. The disciples have no idea what to make of him. His family thinks he's crazy. Demons flee from him. And the Gentiles want nothing to do with him. All this is coming to a point, to the center of Mark's gospel, chapter 8, which we'll see in, in upcoming months, God willing, where Jesus asks the question. It's the question that you and I need to answer. Who do men say that I am? Who do they say I am? When they try to be all eloquent and philosophical, he looks at them and says, who do you say that I am? And so that's the question we're moving to. That's the question that should be on your minds and on our minds is, who do we claim Jesus is? Who is he? Are we like the, the crowds that just want the miracles? The benefits of the kingdom without the king? Are we like the Gentiles that say, please leave me alone, Jesus, because I don't want you to wreck my world and my worldview? Are we like the religious leaders that have such hard hearts that they can't see what the gospel is? Good news for people, for needy people, for sinners. Who are we? What's our response? So Jesus comes into Nazareth. It says his hometown, Mark 1 tells us that would be Nazareth. The other, gospel, Nazareth, the other gospels confirm it. Nazareth doesn't have a great reputation. It's like a town in the sticks or the middle of nowhere. In John's gospel, when Peter tells his brother, hey, we, we, found, we found the one who's, I guess he said, he didn't say the Messiah at that point, but we found this, this great miracle worker guy, like he's a prophet. His brother said, where's he from? He said, he's from Nazareth. He said, can anything good come from Nazareth? They're astonished, but they don't believe. They know of his works and his power, and they hear his teaching. Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, when you read this, it's, it's, the notes are in your bulletin. You could check these things out. He comes into town with his disciples, and they know he's a rabbi now, this guy who was a carpenter. And so the, the, the tradition would be if a rabbi is respected, comes into the synagogue, you, give, you let him teach or you let him read. And so they, they let him read and he reads from the, from the scroll, part of Isaiah, that basically says, the kingdom is here, good news is here. The lame walk, the poor have good news preached to them. He closes the scroll, he says, this has been fulfilled in your presence, this long-awaited prophecy. And in Luke's gospel, they marveled at him too and they loved it until he told them what that meant for them. So our text says today. It took offense at him. He offended them by that. They knew who this guy was. They grew up with him. They played with him. His I mean, can you imagine if you were a peer of Jesus age-wise, playing ball with him? Do they have balls back? Playing rocks with him? I don't know what they played. Chasing each other around. Did Jesus ever get tricky when they didn't see it? I don't think so. His uncles, his aunts were there. He's teaching them. He says, this carpenter. The word for carpenter is the word tecton, which is a, a word where we get uh, it, it, technology from. He's a technologist. 
He's a maker of things. We think that means just wood. Back then that word was, was for people who could fashion wood and stones, stone and metal. It's a real handy guy to have around in a town. It's not derogatory. It's a good profession. It was a needed profession. Jesus had made things for these people. Isn't that neat? He, the creator of the universe, Jesus Christ, in him all things were created, right? He is the active ingredient in creation. His earthly profession for the first 30 years of his life was a creator. But what they're saying is carpenters don't become rabbis. We know his brothers. His brothers' names are there. Of course, the, um, the Catholic Church in maintaining the uh, eternal virginity of or perpetual virginity of Mary, don't believe these are the brothers. They're family members or whatever. But I have those verses, in, again, in your notes. And they're referred to repeatedly as Jesus' brothers. As a matter of fact, one of those men, James, is referred to as the leader of the church in Jerusalem. We see that in the book of Acts. You might think, well, maybe that's James the Apostle. But Paul tells us in Galatians that he went, when he went to Jerusalem for that Jerusalem council to meet with, he said, I met with James, the Lord's brother. Judas here is just the word for Jude. He's not Judas Iscariot. His name is Jude. We have a letter, just like we have a letter from James in our Bible, we have a letter from Jude. And Jude calls himself the brother of James. So these are Christ's earthly brothers. I don't think they're from Joseph from another marriage because there's no indication in the birth narratives of all these kids of Joseph traveling with Joseph and a pregnant Mary to Bethlehem to give birth. There's no, so we take them for what they are, siblings of Jesus Christ. Siblings of Jesus Christ who, again, notes in your bulletin, disbelieve in who he is. How could they? They grew up with him. Familiarity breeds contempt. You ever grow up with people, went to school with them, and you look at them as adults, and you're like, huh? Yeah, I, I, sometime after I graduated high school and college, and many years later, I was hanging out with some guys around a reunion at the school or something, and one of these guys was a surgeon. And I just kept scratching my head. I'm like, I remember you in high school, man. <laughs> like, there's no way I'm letting you operate on me. <laughs> And it's so unfair, but it's like, I, I can't get out of my mind what he did in certain classes to these teachers. It's like, and you know what? I know some people, you look at a kid and you say, that kid's, that kid's going to be a pastor. I hate to burst your bubble, that wasn't me. My grandparents say they thought I was going to be a pastor. They used to put it in their newsletters when I was a kid. It used to kill me. They had those newsletters, you write everything about everybody in the family. But most people that knew me knew I wasn't going to be a pastor. I went to be a technologist, an engineer. And my friends during that time, particularly when I was with Procter & Gamble and I ran with a, a wild crowd and did a lot of things I'm not proud of, when I came to Christ some years later, it's brought conflict. And I've offended them. Not, a, not intentionally, but just they knew me. They thought they did. You're the guy that did this. Now you're telling us what's right and wrong? What, where do you get off? And it was actually an offense. You know, I often hear Christians say, well, Jesus was offensive, so we're called to be offensive. Then you have maybe on the other side saying, well, Jesus says not to offend. If you listen to his instructions. He tells you not to do that, so that's why we don't offend anybody. This is the problem with our world today, and particularly in America and Western civilization, Western culture today. It's everything is these false dichotomies. We've got to get away from that. Package deal ethics, false dichotomies. The best way I've had it explained to me, because I asked a friend when I was early in seminary, a pastor, I'm like, ah, you, know, I, you know, Christ was offensive. He offended a lot of people. Are we supposed to be offensive? And yet he said, you know, and he said this, and I don't know where he got it from. But we are not called to be offensive at any point or place where the gospel and Jesus isn't offensive. 
Jesus himself is offensive. That's where the offense is. And the cross of Jesus Christ is offensive. That's where the offense is. But we're called to be gentle and patient and let it, to let our reasonableness be known to all. They see miracles. Mighty works. They see his wisdom, yet they do not believe. And this is an important thing for us to get. Seeing is not believing. And miracles don't change people. Unless the Holy Spirit is changing them. And so, you know, Jesus talks about this quite often. And I think of John's Gospel, John chapter 6. This is where he had just fed the 5,000. And they want to make him king. And so he sends the disciples to the other side on a boat because he does not want that to go to their head. And he goes and he leaves in a roundabout way. And the crowds meet him there. They're ready to make him king. Then he starts saying hard things once again because always, he's always going to challenge your presuppositions and your worldview of what the king and the kingdom is. And he starts saying, I fed you with bread, but I am the bread of life. Just like Moses gave you manna in the wilderness, that's me. So suddenly, these people that were just fed by Jesus, if you could feed, again, 5,000 men, many, many, maybe three times that was there, you could feed an army, right? If you could make bread out of, come out of a few loaves and fish come out of a few fish. So John 6.30, so they said to him, then what sign do you do that we may see and believe you? What works do you perform? So Jesus replies to them. But I have said to you that you have seen me and yet you do not believe. They saw the works. They saw him feed them. They saw him make crippled people stand, blind people see, deaf people hear. He's going to raise people from the dead. They do not believe. John 10 confirms that even stronger. 10, 37, and uh, 39. If I am not doing the works of my Father, then don't believe me. So he tells them. Look, if I'm not doing work from God, then yeah, you're right, don't believe me. Uh, but if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I am in the Father. So I get it, you don't believe me. Are the works that I'm doing from God? This is what the Pharisees were trying to wrestle with. That's why when Nicodemus comes to him, he says, teacher, we know what you're doing is from God. So if you know that what I'm doing is from God, believe me. Yet you see and you don't believe Matthew's gospel is, is uh, very frightful in, verse, in chapter 11. Verse 20. Then he, being Jesus, began to renounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done. That's the word in our text today, right? Mighty works. We'll look at it in a second. Because they did not repent... Woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works, same phrase, done in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I, and those are cities that were judged in the Old Testament for their great sin. They didn't have the mighty works to know. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon and for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven you will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, and you know that Sodom was burned in judgment, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Mighty works. See, what do mighty works do? Once again, there's no neutral response to Christ. If they're done 
and there's unbelief, the judgment is greater. But the Spirit can use them to bring to belief. See, how could people see the mighty works and Jesus says they don't believe him? Because they're believing in the works, not in the one working them. They see, they, they believe that works were done. The Pharisees at one point accused of being done by the hand of Satan. But they would not reconcile it with this Jesus that they knew because they were familiar with him and because it necessarily, accepting him would be changing their worldview. He is an offense to them. We're in a society where this shouldn't surprise us. Anyone with different ideas is an offense to somebody else. We get that now. It's like crazy, right? If you have a different idea from somebody, you have offended them just because you had a different idea. Why would we not think that of Christ? As I said, the gospel is itself an offense. 1 Peter First Peter 2, 6 to 8. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. Whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. Verse 7. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Jesus Christ is the power of God, the gospel, power of God for salvation to all who believe. But for those who don't believe, it's an offense. Paul in Galatians 5.11 says that if he resorts back to the law, he makes the offense of the cross nothing. Calls the cross itself an offense. 1 Corinthians 1.23 We preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to the Gentiles. The cross of Christ is silliness, it's foolishness, it's an offense. But listen to this, what it says in verse 24, 1 Corinthians 1, 24. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Let's look at those words, the power and the wisdom, because those are the words in our text. They acknowledge what wisdom given to him and how are such mighty works done by his hand. That phrase, mighty works, that's repeated over and over for what Jesus does is the word dunamis, which is where we get our word dynamite. It's just the word for power. He does power. Powerful things. How is such power done by his hands? Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1.24 that Jesus Christ is the power and the wisdom of God. The word for wisdom is Sophia. It's a beautiful name. name anybody going to have a kid? I want a Sophia in the church. In Luke chapter 4, when this very scene, it said Jesus came in the power of the Holy Spirit. power. Romans 1.16 says, for I'm unashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation for all who believe. He's not ashamed. To those who are perishing, an offense. To those who are being saved, the power of God. The same thing. There's no middle ground. Jesus himself is the message and the wisdom and the power of God. Verse 2 says they were astonished. They were astonished by him. How can he do these mighty works? Look at verse 6, or verse 5 and verse 6. 
He could do no mighty work there. Same words. Now verse 6. And he marveled because of their unbelief. They're astonished at his mighty works. And he's marveling because he can't do any works there because they don't believe. Is that a hard statement? He could do no mighty work? I mean, is Jesus limited? Matthew's gospel, the same thing, says he does no mighty work because they don't believe. But Mark is, is, is stiffening it. What does that mean? Jesus' power is not limited. It's not limited. It's infinite. So what does it mean that he could do no mighty work? Well, he tells you their unbelief. So there's something about belief and unbelief that grants access to the power of God in a person. In the story immediately before this one, Jesus is walking, the crowds are all over him. A man from a synagogue, they had just called him from the devil, but this guy from the synagogue, his daughter's going to die. And so when you, you know, Life throws you those curveballs. You kind of leave your worldview, or you hopefully do, and you go to the source of hope. He asks Jesus Christ to save his daughter. So Jesus goes with him. In the midst of that, the crowd is, is, is all over Jesus, and a woman, an outcast woman, you remember this hopefully from last summer, a woman who was unclean because she, she had a sickness, and that made you unclean in that society. You, she was ridiculed by other people. She had shame from other people. She couldn't show her face in society. But she braved the crowds, probably hidden, and she thought, if I just, if I just touch the tassel of this man's garment, I'll be made well. Maybe he won't know. And then, I, then I won't make him unclean. So she touches the tassel of his garment and it says the power of God went out of Jesus. And he had to stop. He felt the power come out of him. It's the same word. And it said he marveled at her belief or he was amazed at her great faith. And now here are these people he's saying the opposite. He could do no power because there's no faith. Jesus' power is not limited but access to it is. Now be sure Jesus healed people that, I mean, he healed people before they even knew they, that he was going to heal them. He cast out demons before people even knew they were in his presence. But in, this, in the presence of unbelief, there's no access to that grace. Think of it like a faucet, full of grace. The water's there, full capacity. But there's nothing to turn the faucet. Or from engineer friends or people who like physics. Does this phone, not the battery in it, but this phone by virtue of being here have energy? Yes, it's called potential energy. Because if I let go of it, which I'm not going to do for demonstration purposes, but if I let go of it, then it has kinetic energy. The energy is there It needs to be activated. What's the point? The pastor at my old church, whenever I tell this illustration, I've told here, I I give him credit for it because it's just phenomenal. His name's T.J. Campo. He says that faith is the organ of reception for grace. And he goes on to explain it this way. He says, He says, the eyes are the organ of reception for light so that the body can receive the stimuli they're getting and know that there's people in the room. The eyes don't create you. They receive the light so that we could see you. I could see you. The ear is the organ of reception for sound waves. The ear doesn't create the sound. It receives the sound. And the brain benefits from it. Faith is the organ of reception for grace. It doesn't create grace. It doesn't earn grace. It doesn't make Jesus give you grace. The grace is there and it just receives it by faith. The way your ear hears sound. The way your eyes see light. Faith 
receives grace. There's no grace. There's no faith. Jesus says when you have faith, he gives you living waters, a spring that just overflows. Can Christ do no powerful work in our lives because we're just not exhibiting faith by getting caught up in all the idolatry that we have in this world and in this country and what's going on around us? Important stuff, I know. But not faith. And yet our text shows some people get grace. That's what it says. Except that he laid his hand on a few sick people and healed them. Just like a matter of fact. How, how many of you know that changed people's lives? That that was a mighty work he did in somebody's life, whoever it was. You see, this is the upside down kingdom. The people are offended at the very thing that offers hope. At the very person who can solve their problems and give them life and grace. What is foolishness to them is true wisdom. What is weakness to them is true strength and power. It's the sick who are able to receive the truth. It's to the sick that Christ gives healing and hope. The strong are faithless. The weak are full of faith. Because what else do they have? And until we are ready to see ourselves as needy and in need of saving, even as Christians, not that we lose our salvation, but we need Christ for our daily breath to even make it through this world, then he will be able to do no powerful work in our lives. Because faith is not just the entry point into the Christian life. It is the daily disposition or way of being or the way of the Christian life. Saved by faith for faith. The righteousness of God that comes from faith. By faith, receive salvation for faith to walk in faith. In Mark 2.17... So earlier in Mark's gospel, and the, you know, when you read a book, you keep these things in mind because he's building on an argument. When they take offense to him, he says, those who are well have no need of a physician. Mark 2, 17. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. That's a very clear comparison or combination of physical need and spiritual need. He's using physical reality. Sick need doctors. He comes as a physician healing sick people, but he's saying the point of that is I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. Spiritual reality. The question is, do we see ourselves as sinners? Because everybody is a sinner. But he's saying, if you don't think you're a sinner, you have no faith, you cannot receive the grace that I'm trying to pour into you. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. This text teaches a very important point about remnant theology. You know what remnant theology is? God has a remnant, a people that you can't even see. And as dark as it gets, there's people there. So we see it in the prophets all the time. Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah sees God in the throne room, high and lifted up. And he, in his glory of the Lord, he, he says, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips, among a people of unclean lips. And then in that acknowledgement of his need, he is purified and cleansed and made a new creation. Then God says, whom shall I send? I have a mission. Who wants to go? We all want to go. Isaiah says, here I am, Lord. Send me. He says, okay, here's the mission. I'm going to send you and they're not going to believe. You're going to teach righteousness and they're going to be wicked. They're going to persecute you. Do you guys still want to go? 
But then he says this, but I have a tithe there. I have a tenth there. I have people there. The same words that is going to bring judgment and justice and condemnation are going to bring my remnant to life. Same thing happens to Elijah. Elijah's with Ahab and Jezebel and he flees them and he's hiding. And God says, why are you fleeing and hiding? He says, because I'm the only one who follows you who's left. It's like Christians are saying that here in America. And God says, not so. I have 7,000 people there who have not bent the knee to Baal. There is a remnant. And folks, in America, there is a remnant. Some of us are sitting here in this room. Some of us are sitting in other churches across the country. And some of them, some of us, we don't even know who they are. And they don't know it. But they have need. They need the gospel. And God will bring them to faith in the midst of a dark time. This does not explain our present day and age. Where's the remnant, Lord? Where are they? Where are the Christians? We, we raised kids. Why did they leave the faith? Where's the people? How did this country leave Judeo-Christian roots? Where are they? Lord? Can you do no mighty work here, Lord? He says, look at the unbelief. But there's some sick there. They need healing and hope. Will you be those agents? Maybe we need to start seeing ourselves like the sick in need of God's work instead of like the strong who need no saving. Us in the church. Maybe then we won't be so rocked when things don't go our way politically or are offensive to us or when we see our way of life slipping away. All important things, I grant you. But because we'll be smart enough to realize that we were always needy. We're not just needy now because we're losing political influence in this country. It was an illusion we had. We're needy. Do you need him? Do you want God to do powerful work in your life? Mighty deeds for you to bear the true wisdom of God. Do you want that? He says, be needy. For Paul says, for when I am weak, then I am strong. So I accept all kinds of calamity and persecutions and all that. I accept it all. I welcome it, Paul says. Because when I am weak, then I am strong. And that's the promise. It's an amazing thing. The two things that they recognize in Christ but cause an offense in them are the two things that by the Holy Spirit we are promised as believers of Jesus Christ. When we talk about those two things, the wisdom and the power of God, the wisdom and the mighty works of God, which was promised us by the Holy Spirit. I just paraphrased 2 Corinthians. Let me actually read it. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power, this is Christ talking to Paul, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, Paul says, I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. We get the dynamite, the dunamis of Christ. To be dynamic, to show his power to the world. I will boast all the more gladly of my weakness so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For the sake of Christ, then, I am content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Is that only for Paul? How many of us are saying that? I'm content with weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions, and calamities. For when I am weak, then I am strong. I admit it's the hardest thing in the world. But when we do that by faith, we get what? Grace. What is that grace? The power of God working in us. Jesus Christ, again, is the wisdom and the power of God to those of us who are being saved. So we get the power of God, I just said, and we get the wisdom of God. And you, you know that from, from the book of James and from all kinds of places. James 1, 5. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without approach, and it will be given to him. You want the wisdom of God? You ask him. Colossians 1, 9. 
And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding. Man, we live in a day where, there's, where truth is, is relative. and all. Do we want true truth? As Francis Schaeffer would call it, true truth. In other words, not fake news. Wisdom, we can have that. Do we really want it though or do we just want power? Uh, Ephesians 1.17. I do not cease to give thanks to you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him. It's a beautiful chapter. So many verses, I can't, I can't go through them. We're given that spirit, the spirit of Christ that walked into his hometown with his followers to bring the gospel. Repent and believe in the gospel. I'm the king. There's good news. And they reject him and they're offended by him even though they see the power and the wisdom in him. And then if we're given the great commission to go do what he did, to go Go to all the nations, make disciples, baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them all I've commanded you, right? So we go in the power and wisdom of Christ resting upon us as we walk by faith. What do we think? Do we think we're going to be welcome? If Jesus was, his, his own friends and family and neighbors were offended by that, why would we expect any different? We're a country that has grown up with Christ in our homes and in our backyards, and we're a country that has a great offense to the only salvation and hope you and I know. Let's not be surprised by it because he still has people here in this country who need healing and hope. Would we be agents of that? The only way we can do that is by faith, by walking by faith. And taking those insults, hardships, persecutions, and actually viewing them as strength and not weakness because he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world and he has a great destination and hope for us and he is our king, so if God is for us, who could be against us? Let's find the remnant. Let's preach good news. Last year we studied the rejection of the Pharisees in Mark chapter 2. And Jesus tells them at some point, he says, you know, you can't put new wine into old wineskins. What, what I have is new wine. And, and you remember the analogy there is, is wine's put into wineskins, it ferments and it, it, it expands them and then it hardens the wineskin. And so you put new wine in there, it can't expand anymore because it's just calcified and hard and it splits the wineskin. And Jesus says, I'm doing something new that doesn't fit your wineskin, that doesn't fit your worldview. I need a new wineskin. Christians, let's be new wineskins. Soft and supple and hearts made alive that can receive what God is pouring into us by faith so we can get grace to show that to the world. And if you don't know Jesus Christ and if you are offended by him and yet you recognize there's there's, there's something to what I'm saying and what I've read in in the word of God, read it for yourself if you don't want to take what I'm saying. Because what I'm saying is not the word of God. This is the word of God. I pray I preach it faithfully. Read this. Ask the Lord. I have news for for non-Christians. It's not that Christians had the right information and didn't have to give anything up. Jesus Christ will challenge every one of our worldviews. And so when we're asking Christians, you non-Christians, people who have not professed faith in Christ because he's an offense to you, because he will change your worldview, know that that's what is supposed to happen to us that claim Christ. Jesus says to everyone, deny yourself and follow me. I pray you would do that as whoever's hearing this that doesn't know Jesus as Lord. Let's pray.